So the agenda for today is to obviously talk about the iterate um, and evaluate process. Um, just really quick, you probably already know, know what that is, so we're not going to spend too much time on that um, part, but just to give you an overview on um, what that's all about, then the web analytics, um, soft versus hard launch, kind of thinking about how you want to put your prototype out there, your dissemination plans, and then um, the MailChimp campaigns. So I'll pass it over to Mark, our lovely host. Uh, the iteration process, as you know, is the process of continuous improvement. Um, so it's where you're going to be planning, developing, and refining your project until it's complete. At this point, I think I've just heard that some of you already are at this point, uh, you have completed one cycle of the iteration process um, and have now developed a prototype for your data application. Um, and so with that in mind, it's time to evaluate um, what you have currently. Um, so when you are evaluating, continue, uh, consider these uh, three questions. These do, not to be, these do not need to be answered sequentially, but they're just there for you to uh, guide yourself in the evaluation process. So uh, first up is, does your web application do what you intended? Um, at very least, your application should do what you wanted it to do. Um, if it doesn't, then outline where it fails to meet expectations, what works, what could work better, um, and uh, what to tackle in your next iteration cycle. Uh, secondly, um, are there any issues with the web application? So this includes major uh, major bugs, minor bugs to the web application. Uh, locate any of those and try to fix them. Um, if there are any major design flaws that result in the web application being difficult to use or interpret, um, gather those as a list of issues and add them to things that you want to tackle in the next iteration process. Um, and of course, use your stakeholders. Um, so they'll be excited to uh, view or test out the application, um, invite them to see what you have so far, and um, they might be able to find bugs that you missed. Um, finally, uh, can your intended audience use the web application in a way that is uh, intuitive? So this is by far the most important question, um, as it determines if your application can be even usable by your intended audience. Um, so best way you can do to answer this question is by using your stakeholders, or even you can invite members of your target audience to uh, focus groups or wor workshops that showcase your application. Um, so invite them to test out your application and track where they have problems, either using the application or interpreting it, or interpreting it. Um, and get feedback on what might help them better utilize the app and what design flaws your application currently has. Um, if, however, you go through all these answers and all your questions look good, then you are ready for launch. Um, first up, before we even get into launch, you need to begin setting up uh, a few things on the back end to make sure that you are prepared. wanted to present this idea today uh, also to point out it's kind of optional. It's not a requirement by any means, but it's one of those things you want to consider before you do launch um, launch your app or your website or anything like that. So um, the idea of web analytics is that you can track usage of your site and who visits it. Um, these are some questions you depending on the provider you use, which I'll talk about a little more in a second, you can actually get more data than this, more information about people than this, um, which you may or may not want. So you kind of keep in mind what, what what your priorities are if you're starting to track usage of your site. Um, and yeah, so these are all pretty basic things, I think, but one thing you might not think about is whether people are using a mobile device or a laptop to visit your your website or your app. Yeah. yeah. Um, and there's a handful of other other things you could be learning. So I'll, next slides are going to show some examples from um, one of our our dashboards, and I guess I just mentioned this, but we use um, so we use this uh, provider called Plausible Analytics, and you've certainly heard of Google Analytics, which I'll um, talk about a little more later, I think. And uh, yeah, so we'll see some dashboard examples of, of what you can get if you are have added analytics to your website. So this is for our main web page for the sdohplace.org website. So just an example of getting 
times people visit it, how many unique visitors. Um, you'll see this idea here, this uh, stat of bounce rate and bounce to, is when someone just comes to the homepage and kind of leaves right away. So there's some, how long people are visiting is something to that's nice to learn about. Um, some other things that uh, analytics can help you learn is where people come to your site from. Uh, you can see on the left, there's like Google, Twitter, Bing, uh, search engines uh, directly from this toolkit um, site. And uh, there's a lot of different ways you can track this. You can even be really specific about it. And you can add like a little bit of text to the end of a link. Like if you share something from Facebook, you might see it has this whole UTM underscore campaign and all this stuff at the end of the link that adds more information when someone clicks it. So there's a lot more information you can start to collect. And then of course, what pages people are visiting, what pages they entered on or left on. And then next one. Uh, and then where people are and what kind of devices they're using. So <clears throat> this is generalized and plausible just kind of by city. So it's not too specific, but it, you know it's helpful to know where your audience generally is. Um, and like I had mentioned, um, you know, browser, mobile, desktop, that kind of thing. All these are just, it's useful to know. It's not necessary by any means, but just to make you aware that these are things that you can, you could put into your site if you wanted. Typically, it's actually really easy to do these. You kind of, you find a provider um, and then uh, they provide you with a snippet, like a little bit of code that you inject into one of your uh HTML files and or all of your HTML files. And I also want to point out if you're using something like ArcGIS Online to make your app, um, it's worth looking around because they might either have already visit numbers, they might already track some of that information for you. So you don't need to do anything complicated at all um, with those solutions. Um, also, sometimes I feel like it's fairly common that Google Analytics will be built into certain sites and all you do is have to provide a key. So you kind of sign up and then get a, a, like a token from Google Analytics and then you add that into your no code application that you've created on a different website. So those are things to keep in mind and, and look out for. All right, so just to talk a little bit about the different providers. Um, so we use this one called Plausible. Uh, it's actually not free, so it's not necessarily the one that everyone should just right away check out, but I think it's worth learning about why it's um, why it's a, a popular one. Um, Google Analytics, which we had used in the past, collects a lot of information about people because ultimately Google Analytics is a marketing platform. So you can get information you might not be expecting to get, like demographic information, things you wouldn't think you'd be able to learn from someone visiting your website. But Google Analytics has, you know, an insane amount of information in it because it's Google. So, and it's free because what you pay for is with the data, um, you know, that you are giving them from your visitors. So um, we didn't need by any means that much information. And so we, <clears throat> Uh, went with this one plausible, which like you could see those interfaces are very simple, very easy to understand kind of dashboards. Um, and it's an open source code base, which if we ever did, which I don't personally want to do, but you could self host it and you'd be completely independent of the, even the plausible website. You would host your own tracking system basically. Um, and then here's some other ones that I um, was looking around and finding um, Matomo and Insights. And these are all build themselves as privacy focused um, and they don't store cookies on your user's uh, browser and they just don't collect any identifiable information from, from your users. So we advocate for that, of course, in, in the lab. And I think it's also just important to understand what you really want to learn and and whether you need to be, you know, what provider is going to give you what you need. If you really just need page views, you know, there's um, some of these simpler ones will will get you that very easily and free. And that's about it. I just, um, it's good to think about these things before you do the launch, because that's when you get a lot of clicks. <laughs> and it's, it's fun to see people looking at your site and track uh, usage. At this point, you have a fully realized web application and you're ready to showcase to the public. You've set up web tracking potentially um, and you're ready for the launch. So it's not enough just to make it go 
public, you have to make sure that your audience knows that your application even exists. Um, so there are two uh, launches, the soft launch and the hard launch. Uh, the soft launch is used for when your project is uh, pretty much complete, but there still might be some minor or minor bug bugs or fixes that are needed to um, needed to make to the final data application, um, but that these minor bugs might dissuade people from accessing the application in the future potentially. Um, additionally, um, if you are working with a uh, or if you're designing an application for a uh, sensitive topic, uh, a soft launch might be the best uh, way to ensure that your audience can at least test out the application, that you invite like a small pool of people to test out the application um, and provide feedback um, just in case if there is anything major that might dissuade people from using it down the line, um, that you can fix that before you move on to a hard launch. So a soft launch, uh, limits the number of people to um, a small pool of who can access it first. So this might be your stakeholders um, and their network. Uh, if you invited focus groups, it might also be those um, individuals that you invite just to be like, hey, come over. Uh, we have made it public. Test the app and give us any, uh, provide us any feedback that you have. The best way to determine whether or not uh, you want to go with a SARD versus a hot launch uh, or a soft launch versus a hard launch um, is to ask yourself if your intended audience um, might never visit your application again, should there be an issue that they can't get past. Um, if that answer is yes, you might want to do a soft launch first. Um, um, otherwise, you might just go straight to a hard launch. Uh, hard launch is just the official public launch of the data application. Um, for this, you can still accept user feedback, but a majority of that feedback is going to be minor bug fixes that went unnoticed uh, somehow um, and are easy to fix, or um, suggestions for expanding the application in the future. Um, in other words, bulk of the work is complete and there is not much, if anything, left to do, uh, but to make it public. Uh, so one example of a soft launch is Facebook. Uh, so Facebook launched in 2004 exclusively for Harvard students, and then as it saw success, it began expanding to other universities, then high schools, and then finally in 2006 to anyone over 13 with an email address. Um, allowing uh, This slow uh, launch sequence allowed them to slowly grow and expand their reach until um, in a more controlled manner. Uh, easy example of a hard launch, at least for me, it was Pokemon Go. Um, so that launched in 2016 to multiple countries um, and then eventually just quickly expanded globally. Um, it's, uh, it became one of the uh, fastest growing applications like around 2016, um, or at least for mobile devices. Um, but once you have finally reached the hard launch stage, you need to talk about social media promoting. So uh, once you have made your website public, you have a landing page, you have configured web tracking, and uh, you have decided whether or not you're doing a soft or a hard launch, uh, once you've reached the hard launch stage, it's time to start promoting your web application. Um, actually letting know that your uh, to your target audience, your public audience, that, hey, my web application is up and running. Here's where you can find it. Um, First step is to think about where your audience is going to most likely be spending their time on social media. Um, so these are the most common social media apps. So we have Facebook. Uh, this will be a typically more mature audience. Uh, it says 30 plus, but we've uh, I've looked at the numbers and it's been mostly 40 plus individuals um, around that age range um, spending most of the time on uh, Facebook. Typically family oriented, uh, people and it's not really ideal for the younger audiences like younger than 25 years of age. Um, LinkedIn, so typically another more mature audience, so 30 plus um, professionals, academics, and career minded individuals. However, this is beginning to grow steadily in popularity with uh, younger audiences, typically college students. Um, so those with the individuals on LinkedIn. Um, X, formerly Twitter. Uh, so that's going to be mainly individuals aged 20 to 30 years old uh, with various interests. Um, 
Uh, however, the uh, audience there predominantly identifies as male. Um, I think it's like about 60% of the user base on X at the moment is identifies as male. Um, so that's something to keep in mind. Um, additionally, uh, something else to note is that we are seeing a little bit of a decrease in uh, people um, using uh, X or formerly Twitter. Not sure if that's going to remain ticking down or if it's going to stabilize anytime soon, but that's also something to keep in mind um, that depending on your audience, they might be migrating towards different apps. Um, and finally, there is Instagram. Um, so that's going to be your youngest audience. That's going to be like individuals less than 25 years. Um, typically around college age is where you're going to get most of the like adult uh, uh, people, but you know, there are, you know, younger audiences on there, uh, but pretty ideal for reaching uh, students. Um, additionally, you could also, uh, something I mentioned, try TikTok, uh, but you know, that's not something that we typically have experience in. So that's why it's not mentioned. But if you are interested in doing TikTok, that's also going to be quite a young audience. Uh, <laughs> um, so just keep that in mind uh, going forward. And I will note um, something here as well. So um, our team has also in the past, like in collaboration with other communications teams, um, done targeted our advertising, like through Facebook, for example, where you can um, you know, focus advertisements within a very specific zip code. Um, and it, there's, there's many kind of pros and cons <laughs> with that. And it really depends on what action you're expecting from the, the community. Like in our case, we were promoting um, sharing stories about the um, about people's experience with the U.S. COVID out or with the with the with the pandemic, um, and inviting people to share their stories with the U.S. COVID Atlas. Um, and as a result, we got a huge like uptick in people looking at the website, which was great. Like if that was what our goal was, we would have definitely met that. However, our goal was to get the next step, people actually sharing their stories. And that did not, that was not successful. We didn't get, we probably had more people looking at the website than ever before, <laughs> but um, it turns out that um, people tend to prefer sharing stories about things like their pandemic experience in person. So we've had a lot of experience at like tabling events, like at the farmer's market or, or that sort of thing for those kinds of, you know, action oriented um, outcomes. Um, so that's kind of that was a big lesson learned from our team that I wanted to share. But then also I wanted to note that um, we also received a huge amount of um, kind of conspiracy based um, negative <laughs> negative commentaries in the Facebook crowd. Um, so so do keep that in mind as well, and and have a plan for that, or th like think about um, either for yourself or with whatever team members you're working with, like what your strategy is for that. Um, and yeah, I know that like Zoom bombing was was used to be a big thing. It's not as common anymore. But whenever you're disseminating, um, always think about what the rules of the road are. Um, so we share that the first week that we had had this fellowship meeting. We weren't really <laughs> concerned with this crowd. Um, but that's another kind of thing that you can think about. All right. So once you have decided where your uh, target audience is going to be located, Next up is creating social media profiles. Uh, so this is on the right there. You can see an example of our uh, uh, Twitter profile for the US COVID Atlas. So uh, first up, the username is simple and easily searchable. For the COVID Atlas, it's literally just COVID underscore Atlas. Um, bio includes a short summary of the application, as you can see there. Um, and there is a link directing them to the application landing page. Um, the profile image is of the application logo or something similar. Um, and the banner also provides additional information regarding the application. Um, so all of that is set up um, and easily findable and it doesn't look like uh, anything sort of like spammy. All right. Once you have set up your social media profiles and decided where your target audience is going to be, next up will be developing a dissemination plan. Uh, so you decide what websites and in-person sites to do, uh, to post your marketing to and, uh, your social media posting schedule. So 
you can create this easily in um, uh, Excel. Google Sheets is a go-to. Um, if you're uh, using Notion, you can also develop this through Notion. Um, but typically, it'll include you know a spot for you to include an image or the link to the image that you're going to be using, uh, the text, who made it, um, its theme, where it's going to be posted, and what date and time. Um, as well as if you want, you can set up like a review system and whether or not that post went out. Um, this way you can set up like a bunch, uh, you can plan out your uh, social media promoting well in advance, um, especially on websites that might not have a scheduling system like Twitter does um, or X, um, whatever. <laughs> um, uh, and it just allows you to track dissemination more easily. Here's an example of a social media post. Um, so this is one of our recent Twitter posts um, promoting the symposium. Uh, so as you can see, it includes a um, short description um, of uh, what you're promoting uh, and includes a link to a landing page and any relevant hashtag. So here we have um, SQH for social determinants of health and hashtag health equity um, and a accompanying image. Um, images are quite important to include on your social media posts as they um, catch people's attention. Because uh, if you're thinking as they're like scrolling through um, whatever the, their homepage, they might just be um, scrolling through a wall of text. They might completely skip over your stuff, but if you have a picture, it'll cause them to like stop and maybe consider it for a moment. Um, Competing images can be created quite easily using Canva. Um, that is our go-to. Um, I don't really think there is a better um, website for creating promotional images like this. Canva has a free tier. Um, I think we pay for the upgraded um, tiers, but uh, the free tier is still pretty um, easy, uh, easily accessible and usable um, for creating promotional images. Uh, additionally, per your social media post, another um, bit of web tracking that you can do is at the bottom of every social media post, there will be an option to view analytics. Um, and this, and they change the what they call it depending on the app due to like copyright issues. Um, so for Twitter, it's going to be uh, view post engagements at the bottom. Um, for LinkedIn, it's called view analytics. And then for Instagram, it's uh, what is it? Post insights. Um, not sure what it is for Facebook, but I think it's also like uh, post insights or view analytics, something along those lines. Um, and this will just give you more information on each social media post, like how many people have viewed it, um, if they haven't interacted with it, um, who's liked it. Uh, sometimes it'll even show like like uh, who actually the accounts are that have liked the post. Um, or retweeted it or commented on it, um, as well as at least for LinkedIn. Um, LinkedIn will go even further in depth and show you uh, the like uh, jobs or like the uh, uh, the titles that people have as they're viewing your things, like the professors or research assistants. Um, so it's just another way of inc uh, increasing the amount of knowledge you have of like who's actually seeing um, your social media posts. Um, and like how effective those are uh, doing. Up, we have sending, like actually reaching out to individuals uh, through email. So MailChimp is a web application that enables users to send newsletters um, and email campaigns to a contact list. Um, we're not gonna talk about the newsletter side, um, but if you are interested in that, uh, that is something you can do. You can have people subscribe to a newsletter chain. Um, but <clears throat> in terms of email campaigns, um, it allows people for you to track how many people have opened your email and how many of them have clicked that email, uh, any links on that email address that sends them somewhere else. Um, and it just better allows you to understand the success of, an, of your email campaign. Step one for uh, MailChimp, um, and if you're not using MailChimp, you can also use this as a way of building an email campaign, but this is, MailChimp's just an easier way of doing this. So outside of step one, of course, create your account. There's a free version, but 
not going to go into setting up an account. Um, step one, build and import your contact list. Um, so for building your contact list, you can do things like reaching out to similar community organizations, um, getting uh, most community websites and community organizational websites will have um, an about page that will show the teams. And sometimes even those teams will show like um, contact emails for those uh, members. Um, so you can grab those. You could also just reach out to the organization itself directly to see if anyone might uh, and ask them if anyone would be interested in learning more about your app and if they would like to provide their emails. Um, uh, people in your network um, that have either been like hearing about you talk about your web application or maybe you haven't talked to them about it yet, but they might be interested in it. Um, so getting those emails um, and of course, reaching out to your stakeholders if they have any recommendations for people or organizations that you could reach out to. Um, but once you have a contact list, you can import your contact list to your audience as it's called in, the, in MailChimp. Um, there's an arrow indicating where you can find that. So it'll be under manage audience, import contacts. Um, next up, you create uh, your new email campaign. Um, there's just a button on the left-hand side that says create. Uh, MailChimp will automatically add your audience or your contact list to um, your new campaign. Um, ensure that you have a, a subject to go along with the email um, and a time to schedule and a time schedule to send out, excuse me, your email campaign. Um, for time, if you have an idea of the best time for your target audience to receive this email campaign, um, select that. Um, but if you don't, uh, try to guesstimate as to what the best time it would be. Uh, like my initial um, like gut feeling typically says like around like Monday mornings sometimes um, when people are like just getting started, opening up their email and being like, oh, there we go. Or sometimes... Uh, it, uh, in the afternoon, uh, most weekdays are pretty good to send out as well. Of course, then you create your content. Um, so you can pick a, a template from MailChimp to guide the way the email will look, or you can just develop your own from scratch. Uh, but a word of caution, uh, uh, in your uh, content for your email campaign, some state laws will require uh, for uh, spam reasons that your email campaign includes an address listed at the bottom. Um, so MailChimp will warn you if um, one of your contact, uh, one of the emails on your contact list is from an area that has that. But either ways, um, we recommend if you have an institutional address to use that if you have one um, as a best way to uh, ensure that like, you know, you're not interrupting any spam laws. And of course, after everything is set up, make sure to review, ensure that everything looks correct. You have a subject, everything is good, that your setup time is the correct time that you want. Um, it has an option, as you can see there, to not only preview it um, on the side, but also send a test email. Highly recommend you send at least three test emails to yourself. Um, <laughs> uh, what might look good in a preview or on your website when you open it up in the actual email box might look horrible. Um, so definitely make sure you make use of the test email um, function. Um, it can it can really change <laughs> um, how the mail how the email campaign ends up looking in the finished in the long run. And then of course double check that you have set up your tracking. So at the bottom there will be settings and tracking. Uh, make sure that you are tracking uh, that your settings are set to tracking opens and clicks. So this will indicate how many people have opened the email, of course, and then how many people have. Uh, make clicks on that uh, email campaign. And then typically, of course, those clicks mean that they're clicking on links that go towards um, uh, your web application. And then finally, all that's left to do, if everything looks good, just send it. Um, and you can track analytics. So per camp email campaign, you can view a report of how successful your email campaign was doing. Uh, this is an example of one report. Um, and as we can see here, for 64 recipients, um, we have like 96% uh, successful deliveries, uh, 81 total opens, which probably indicates that multiple people, uh, some people opened it multiple times, and then about 20% uh, clicks per unique open. 
um, which is pretty good. So uh, this is Adila. Uh, Adila is a healthy food advocate for her community and currently volunteers at the local community center. Uh, to help improve food equity and increase knowledge of healthy food options in the area, Adila has created a resource map of healthy food resources in and around her town. Uh, she has spent months of hard work creating uh, her map and is finally ready to release her project uh, to the public for members of the community to use. So her first step is to identify her target audience. Um, she has decided her target audience will be typically uh, either through stakeholder meetings or focus groups. Her target audience will typically be parents and adults with dependents looking for healthy food options for their families. Uh, younger adults around college age that need to be conscious of their diets, but that might not be. Um, and that typically both of these will include members of marginalized communities that might not know of healthy food options in the area that she would like to reach out to as well. So as a result, she has decided that Facebook will hold a majority of her target audience being uh, parents and uh, people with dependents. Um, and so she'll make sure that her Facebook profile is her primary mode of promotion with a majority of her promotions being hosted to the website. Um, and as we can see on this example of a dim dissemination plan, uh, she has a post going out four days a week, once on a Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, and then once on Saturday, um, with the time scheduled for either around uh, lunchtime when people are taking their lunch breaks or around uh, 5 p.m. when people are getting off work. Um, and on Saturdays, we can see it's the only one where she'll be posting at 9 a.m. in the morning when people will most likely be um, waking up, about to either do their grocery shopping or have the data themselves. Um, X or Twitter will be her secondary form of social media um, as it will hold most, uh, some of the target audience that might not be on Facebook, um, but as well as pulling in some of the younger audience that she wants to grab. Um, uh, for this, she has decided that she'll only post twice a week, uh, on Tuesdays and Thursdays, around lunchtime where people are more likely to pull out their phones and be on uh, Twitter or social media apps. And then finally, Instagram will be her last social media profile uh, she sets up to promote. Most of her target audience will not be on Instagram. However, a lot of the younger audience that she doesn't want to isolate, um, but wants to in fact reach, um, will be on Instagram. So as a result, she won't be spending too much time. She'll probably be posting once a week on a Friday um, around 12 p.m. to ensure that she grabs that younger audience before they have made any plans for the weekend. Um, so she'll still set up a profile, but keep her engagement quite low. This will be an example of one of her uh, Twitter posts. As you can see, it includes a short description, um, uh, some emojis to, crap, to grab attention, as well as a link to uh, her uh, mood app, uh, to her food resource map, um, along with an image that I've created in Canva um, as an example uh, to really grab uh, people's attention. Uh, and finally, um, Adila will set up a MailChimp campaign. Uh, so she'll gather a contact list from nearby community organizations with similar goals, other community centers in the area, um, her personal network from her advocacy work and stakeholder recommendations. Um, and afterwards, she has decided she'll send it out early Monday morning where she knows that uh, individuals like in community organizations um, or community centers in her area will most likely be checking their emails as traffic might be low um, due to people not really visiting community centers probably Monday mornings, uh, but instead going to work. Additional steps um, she might take to promote paper flyers in and around her community center and let the volunteers there know that her um, food map is up and running, readily available for everyone to use and to make sure that they know to recommend that to people who visit the community center. Um, and if her community center has a newsletter to also um, promote her resource map there. And finally, with everything set up and running, she's going to monitor her app's progress through web tracking and as well as social media. Uh, she'll be tracking engagement there. Eventually, visits will begin to stabilize and uh, promotions might also begin to stabilize. So she might reduce her frequency of her social media posts um, down to maybe like Facebook, maybe to like twice a week, Twitter to once a week, and then maybe Instagram to like once every two weeks. 
Um, but overall, Adila has completed a successful launch.